Good morning, boys and girls. Today we're going to read chapter 12 of Running Out of Time. And in chapter 11, we were left with the cliffhanger of Jesse um, escaping Clifton in the back of a bread truck. So now we have to see how is she going to get out of this, out of this bread truck. So if you go ahead and open up to page 85, we'll begin chapter 12. Jesse braced herself between a bread rack and the door. Every few seconds, she would think the vehicle couldn't possibly go any faster. Then it would make a gravelly noise like some dying animal gasping for air and speed up. With each burst of speed, Jessie's stomach churned and the bread rack shook harder. Jessie remembered what Mr. Whittingham said every time Clifton heard of some new invention. Ain't natural. Well, going this fast wasn't natural and Jessie wasn't sure she liked it. In the front, the bread man was singing as carelessly as someone might be singing strolling through Clifton. It even sounded to Jessie as if he had others singing with him and a musical instrument or two. She had to be imagining that, though. Jessie shifted her grip on the unlatched side of the door. Caught suddenly in a powerful wind, it swung open. What the... The bread man in the front swore. He hit the brakes, and they worked better than the brakes of any carriage Jessie had ever seen, uh, ever been in. Jessie's body slammed against the latch half of the bread truck's end. A metal rack toppled against her. Some of the brightly packaged loaves of bread flew out the open door. Strangely, the music continued. Jessie crouched, waiting for the bread man to turn around and see her. How could she explain? Would he force her to go back to Clifton? Would he call Miles Clifton and his men? She'd have to try to outrun him. But could she run at all after being hit by the bread racks? Jessie flexed her arms and legs just a little and decided nothing was broken. She'd probably end up with lots of bruises, but that was the least of her worries. The bread truck shuddered to a stop at a last loaf toppled on Jessie's head. Peering through the crooked racks, Jessie saw the bread man step out his door. Jessie had a moment of panic. He was going to find her. And then she grabbed her pack and jumped out the back door. Immediately, she spun around the side of the truck opposite the bread man. Maybe he wouldn't see her. An open ditch sloped before Jessie and she rolled into its tall grasses. Jessie peeked from the grasses in time to see the bread man come around the other side of the truck. He picked up a squished package of bread and then flew and then threw it down in disgust. How am I going to explain this, he complained. I'm going to be even later and I won't have enough bread. They'll say I didn't latch the door and I know I did. He looked at the open door. Jessie ducked lower in the grass, afraid. He'd start looking for someone else to blame. It's not. It's got to be broken, the bread man said, and he fiddled, fiddled with the latch. Jesse heard it click. Normal, the bread man said and swore. Jesse began to tremble. She felt sorry for the bread man, but she couldn't pop up and explain the mysterious open door. He was already mad, and he probably wouldn't even listen to her. He'd just take her back to Clifton. He might do that anyway if he found her. For all she knew, he might be one of Clifton's men. Jessie pressed closer to the ground as if that would make her invisible. She heard the bread man slam the door of the truck. He swore some more. Was he coming to look for her? Then she heard another vehicle pull up behind the bread truck. Peeking through the grasses, Jessie saw a red car. Can I help? What happened? A man's voice said. Door broke, the bread man said. Jessie heard a car door slam. The second man seemed to be looking around. What if he was looking for her? She risked another glance. and She should know if she'd had if she'd have to run, but both men were staring at the back of the truck. Want help picking up the bread? The second man said. No, nah, forget it, the bread man said in disgust. It's no good now. Then both men got into their vehicles and drove away. Jessie waited in the ditch for a while in case one of them figured out what happened and came back to look for her. But if they did, shouldn't she be as far away as possible? Staying as low in the ditch as she could, she crept forward. Jessie wasn't sure how long she how long she half crawled, half slithered through the ditch. The knees of her pants got wet and muddy. Her muscles began to ache from the unusual positions, and she decided she was being silly. Anyone looking for her would have reached this spot already. Those cars went so fast, she wasn't going to beat them by crawling. Besides, she needed to know if she was crawling in the right direction. So Jessie stood up. In front of her, two wide roads spread from horizon to horizon. It was the widest clear, clearing Jessie had ever seen in her life, the widest one she'd remember, at least. Even beyond the roads, there were no woods, only a few trees scattered in pastures on or beside houses. Jessie felt her throat catch at the unfamiliar sight. What had happened to all the trees? 
Sure, settlers were clearing space for farms and villages, but Mr. Smythe had said a squirrel could cross Indiana jumping from tree to tree without once touching the ground if he wanted to. Where were the woods around Clifton the only ones left now? A car whizzed by, and Jessie remembered she didn't have time to mourn the woods. She needed to find out if she was on the right road, going the right way. An enormous truck thundered by with a force that flattened the grasses at the road and whipped Jessie's hair into her face. Even if walking was slower, Jessie was glad to be out of the bread truck. After a few moments of watching, Jessie noticed the cars traveling in different directions on the different roads. On the road by Jessie, the cars went... Jessie glanced at the sun. It was too high overhead to, to be sure of a direction. How could she find out? Then she saw a sign several feet ahead. She ran toward it. The sign came into focus. 37. That was one of the numbers Ma had said might be the right road. Above the number, the sign said north. Jessie grinned. She was going toward Indianapolis. Jessie touched the sign for good luck, amazed once again by the smoothness of the outside world's metal. She'd lost time escaping from Clifton and then the bread truck, but she was going in the right direction, and she was bound to find one of those phone things soon. No one seemed to be looking for her. Surely the most frightening part of her journey was over. Jessie slung her pack over her shoulder and began walking north. She started out in the ditch, but the ground was uneven and the grasses tore at her legs, carelessly forgetting the caution she'd pretended to borrow from Hannah. Jessie moved up the slope to a place where the walking was easier, and she was in plain sight of every car that passed. All right, so tomorrow we will see what happens to Jessie as she walks towards Indianapolis. We do know that she's on the right road. Remember Route 37? That was um, the route that one of the numbers that Ma had told her to be looking for. So she is going in the right direction at least. She escaped the bread truck and for now it seems like she is well into her journey to get help for Katie and the others. So next time we will find out if Jesse has any more obstacles to face as the story unfolds. Thank you.